Well, hello and welcome again to Testable Faith. I'm excited to have Dr. Bob D. Silvestro, PhD in biochemistry, to talk about some of the flaws that exist in our theory of macroevolution. Bob, good to have you back on the show today. Glad to be back. So when you're talking about life and how it gets here, that, that conversation happens almost entirely in the context of evolutionary theory and macroevolution is a key component of that. Um, how do you, when you're talking about that, how do you, what sort of interesting topics do you see when it comes to talking about macroevolution? Well, the idea here is that we could, we started out once upon a time with very, very simple life and that over a long period of time it evolved into people like you and me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and when I first became a Christian, I, I, in college, I wasn't really worried too much about this topic. I was trying to pass my biochemistry test and Later on, I wanted to get into grad school and do work that had some practical value. Mm -hmm. And that's what I thought about. But I started seeing a lot of double standards in, in accountability and in terms of research. When, when I was making conclusions about my research, I always wanted to be very careful not to mm -hmm. say anything more than what I found. Okay. But I was looking at macroevolution research, and I thought, boy, they get away with making speculations <laughs> that I could have never made with, with what my data shows about my area of research. So I started getting bothered by that, and I started looking into the issue more deeply, and I felt like, gee, the, the real evidence doesn't seem to support the idea that new species could come, could come about through just purely natural means, mm -hmm. and that I started seeing, I think there's really evidence for a designer be, behind the beginning of new species. So, so you mentioned in there that what you had to do in getting papers published seemed to not be commensurate, or that seemed to be a higher standard, if you will, than some of the what you do when you're publishing in macroevolutionary theory. Can you give us an example, or how would that play out? I mean, just flesh that out a little bit for us. I mean, in terms of conclusions, like I might say, uh, gee, um, I was doing some research on some transport of the nutrient copper, and I said, perhaps vitamin C is needed to get copper from outside of cells off a carrier molecule through receptor inside of cells. Okay. So I did a little research where we put some vitamin C and mixed it in with some cells and we saw some copper uptake. Okay. But I was a little afraid to say, well, that's exactly what happens in animals or people okay. <clears throat> because I'd only showed it in cells and I hadn't actually shown that it made the copper go through a receptor. I just showed a little bit of of uh, chemical behavior, so to speak. Okay. So I, was, I, I speculated in, in the discussion, but I was very hesitant to overstate mm -hmm. what was going on. I saw evolution research where they would look at just some little thing like differences in colors of moths, for example, where there was pollution. Okay. The, the moths that had a color that blended in with the trees mm -hmm. better during the pollution that over a period of time, they started seeing more of those moths, according to okay. one of the stories. And, and the idea was, well, they hid better from their predators, but then when the pollution was cleared up, the moths that matched the natural right. foliage, then they predominated. And I was, <clears throat> okay, that's fine. I've heard some people argue about that study was manipulated, blah, blah, blah. But let's just say it was, you know, real observation. But that's fine. That, that could happen. But to say that something like that, where you had a change in proportions of, of color, mm -hmm. that that could somehow end up being, well, we have so many changes that moths turned into a whole new species. I thought that was just too big a jump. So, okay, so it seems like th there's obviously some research, some data that's going on there, but you being more circumspect or a little bit careful in what your conclusions seem like, in a, if I get what you're saying, in macroevolutionary papers, there's this we can state this confidently that this is what's going on, that that's, that's what you're getting at in the distinction. Yeah, it was more like uh, what some people call just so stories. Okay. I'll make up a story and there, mm -hmm. that's how it could have worked. But we need more than a story sometimes. We that's need, fair, yeah. We need some hardcore data and we need to look at is the machinery there, is the probabilities there, what do the models actually work? Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of people don't realize this, but in mainline evolution research right now, there's actually a lot of fighting going on. There was a meeting, it's been a few years now, 20, I think it was 2016, over in England, 
where some of the leading researchers in evolution got together, and yet some people that were what called neo-Darwinists, they, they basically, they made a few little changes, but more or less stuck to the stories that Charles Darwin came up with okay. for how evolution could work. Well, there were other researchers saying, that actually doesn't work. Mm -hmm. uh, they were saying some of the same things I was seeing. They're saying that actually doesn't work uh, the way Darwin imagined it, the, the little mutations and natural selection. You can't get to a new species that way. Well, the neo-Darwinists said, yeah, but your ideas don't have any evidence behind them. Okay. So they're both kind of canceling each other out. Meanwhile, there were people at the meetings that represented the idea of intelligent design, the idea of a designer. I would call that designer God, but they just said intelligent designer. They mostly just sat at the meeting and listened because mm -hmm. both of the sides that were fighting were both saying, but but obviously evolution has to be true. We can't bring God into this okay? Uh, because that's against <laughs> the rules, I guess. <clears throat> but why can't we? They were, both sides were saying the other side was wrong. Where does that leave us? I think it leaves us with the idea that there, there's a real possibility, and I think even more than a possibility, I think the data does point to a designer. So, so how strong a conclusion is it that our macroevolutionary theories just have some fatal flaws at this point? It seems like that's what these researchers at this conference were arguing. It's like what Darwin said doesn't work. Some of these new ideas may or may not, but we don't have evidence for them. It seems like there's not a workable model out there of how it actually works. That's true, but they don't want that to really come out. Okay. And I think about, uh, it was a paper from ninth, well, in the late 1990s. It was in the journal Science. It was called, Did Darwin Get It All Right? It was about fossil record. Now, I'm not a paleontologist, but I can read plain English. And plain English said the fossil record doesn't support the way Darwin says these things should have worked. Okay. And they just said it point blank. And they said, well, there is a modification of Darwin's theory called punctuate equilibrium, but it made the comment that there's lots of ideas there, but precious little data. Mm -hmm. And then a paper came out a few years later that was called Rarity is Double Jeopardy. Then it was in Nature, I believe. And it, was, it, it did some things with some, some simpler systems, but it basically said punctuate equilibrium doesn't work either. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so you know, here we're seeing all these mainline papers saying that. So I thought there would be a lot of letters to the editor when that, mm -hmm. that paper came out, because this is a journal that does have letters to the editors about papers that are published in the journal. So I thought we would see a deluge of letters saying, oh, you're being too harsh on the fossil record, <laughs> or this, mm -hmm. this paper saying punctuate equilibrium doesn't work, the species will go extinct, it won't, it won't turn into a new species. <clears throat> but we didn't see that. Mm -hmm. We didn't see any ch real challenges and in fact, uh, I, one of only two letters I ever remember seeing about the fossil paper was saying, I wish you hadn't used that title. It'll <laughs> give ammunition to the creation people. Oh, interesting. And that was the strongest thing they could say. They didn't like the title. So it's not a matter of going where the science is leading. It's a matter of let's not let the public know too much that we're really struggling in this area. Let's just say to the public, oh, we're, we're just fighting about minor details, not the big picture. But it is the big picture that they're really saying doesn't work. So as a, as a takeaway, if I'm sitting here, someone who's interested in science, definitely not in that field, hearing about macroevolutionary theory, what, what is your takeaway? What is the, what is the piece of advice or the, the counsel or the, the word you would give to that person who's saying, I don't know what to think about macroevolutionary theory because it seems like everybody's saying it works? Well, as I just said, there, there's a lot of people that aren't making a big public deal of it, but they are saying there's problems. And I say, that's all right, we'll solve it. But that's really a, a faith statement to mm -hmm. say the theories we've come up with don't work, but we'll find them. That's really almost a blind faith statement. It's saying we know. How do you know <laughs> that the future discoveries aren't going to make things worse <clears throat> in terms of these theories? And, and there's a lot of things I could talk about from a technical perspective. I'll just give you a real simple mm -hmm. one that's not real high science. When species move away from the average, they don't start evolving into something new. They become more fragile. For example, mm -hmm. dogs. 
there are really little dogs and there's really big dogs like Great Danes and there's little dogs like Chihuahuas. They tend to be very fragile, and mm -hmm. the reason they survive is that they're cared for by people. If you threw them out in the wild, they would really have a, a hard time. Right. So that's just a, a very non-intellectual way of just saying this shows that species tend to stay within species. When you get too far afield, they become more inherently fragile. Well, thanks. I really appreciate your comments, Bob. If you found this discussion about macroevolution and how it really does have some serious issues, I would encourage you to check out the description box below. Again, it provides a number of resources that allows you to dig into this more deeply so that you can use it to have great conversations with people you're around.